Hello, my name is Julia Streets and welcome to Diversity Podcast, talking equality, diversity and inclusion in financial services. On each episode, we seek to shine a light on positive progress, call out areas requiring further focus and offer plenty of ideas to inspire change. And to kick off Series 5 of Diversity Podcast, we have gone right into the heart of the fintech community, as this episode has been recorded at the annual Innovate Finance Global Summit at the Guild Hall in the City of London. Innovate Finance is the independent not-for-profit membership association representing the UK's global fintech community. The Global Summit plays host to hundreds of exhibitors and speakers and thousands of delegates. They get to hear from regulators and policy makers, business leaders and commentators across multiple streams, packed with panels, debates and workshops. And sitting high on the agenda of this summit is the question of talent. Does the UK fintech industry have the talent it needs today? And is it set to attract the talent it needs tomorrow? So to set the scene, let's hear from Charlotte Crosswell, the Chief Executive of Innovate Finance, talking diversity and talent from her opening remarks on the main stage. Diversity has rightly become one of the most crucial areas for improvement in financial services in fintech. It has been shown that it is 35% more likely for firms to have higher profitability if they are in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity. Only 17% of senior executives in UK fintech are female and financial services continues to be one of the worst industries for equal pay. In 2018, female-led startups received only 3% of total available funding in the UK. We need to develop more programs, funds, and opportunities to support and channel diverse talent. There are incredibly talented women in fintech. Our annual Women in Fintech Power List received an unprecedented response, and this year 40% of our speakers over the next two days are female. And it is not just about gender diversity. New product development requires diverse ideas and people from different backgrounds. FinTech and financial services cannot continue to push boundaries if we do not widen the talent pools, enhance recruitment practices, and educate from an earlier age, and retrain our teams through the digital revolution. The UK is a global centre for talent, with over 100,000 fintech employees and 3,200 fintech firms predicted by 2030. Recruitment, especially in technology and data science-focused roles, remains a priority for many businesses seeking to expand. I'm delighted to announce that Innovate Finance has launched a fintech jobs board, a dedicated online resource to promote job vacancies, reaching into schools and universities, and promoting fintech opportunities across the country. We must also inspire the next generation. Fintech should be a force for good in educating young people to see the importance of finance in their lives as future users of fintech, as well as a viable career choice. We should be teaching about savings and investments, affordable credit, loans, taxes and mortgages, as well as encouraging the next generation of innovators. That is why we have created a Fintech for Schools campaign to help young people understand how to use fintech, how to work in it, and how to influence the future of finance. I caught up with Charlotte afterwards. You know, skills and talent continues to be an issue for everyone across the market. You know, we are constantly seeing this squeeze on people coming out of schools, out of universities. Have they got the right skills? Have they got the right talent? Have they got digital skills? And guess what? The employers want digital skills. Um, so what we have to do is sit there and say, how do we inspire that generation in schools, in universities to look at tech roles, to look at fintech roles, to look at financial services in a different light than they would have before and retain those those skills they they had at university, but also continue to relearn, retrain in the workplace as well. So by 2030, how many people will be in fintech? The latest census said that there was going to be 100,000 people working in fintech. From my perspective, we've already got over 75,000. The rate of innovation coming through, you've got to think we're going to be probably through that target before 2030, from my personal view. Your company are getting bigger, they're expanding, they're hiring more people, they're getting smarter on going into universities. You know, so I, I would love us to beat that target. So how are we going to find that talent? We're going to find that talent because everyone seems to think that if you want to work in fintech, you have to have digital skills. You have to be an engineer. Yes, there are a lot of roles that are tech related, um, but you could argue that AI and machine learning will take some of those roles over. You know, I've talked to people and entrepreneurs who have come from marketing backgrounds. You know, I think one of our one of our members was doing woodwork, um, sculpturing. You know, history, you look at people's backgrounds, 
anyone can work in fintech. You just have an open mind of what your idea is, what you're trying to solve, and you want to go and solve that problem and take whatever talent you have. And looking at across the UK as well, there, presumably there's enormous potential untapped talents across the UK. What are you doing regionally? I constantly say you, know, you have to solve your talent problem through diversity and you have to solve your talent through a national strategy. You know, it is ridiculous that we only look within the M25 at people who are already here, who already understand financial services and fintech, and sit there and vet your talent pool. No, it's not. There is such great innovation coming out across the country. Um, you know, from the universities, I was in Manchester a couple of weeks ago, sitting there and you talk to them, and you know, innovation's bubbling out of the university. You know, Leeds, Edinburgh, Bristol, Cardiff, you know, still fintech Wales being created. You know, and so what we said is we will try to tie up that network. So we've just signed a deal with Fintech North and Fintech Scotland to create the national network. We're inviting you know, as many hubs as possible to come into that network where we exchange best practices, connect up the ecosystem, and most importantly, look at that talent. You know, on the back of that, we then announced a jobs board where we are now going to start advertising the jobs from our members, but also for non-members to sit there and say, where's the one focal place you can go to? Well, if you want to get a job in fintech, you, know, you want to understand what the companies are doing, that are hiring in fintech, come and look at that jobs board and get involved. And if I think about sort of schools and schools initiatives as well, I know that's one that you're really focused on at the moment. What are you doing there? So Fintech for Schools was launched by Innovate Finance a few weeks ago with John Glenn, Economic Service of the Treasury. Um, and what that is, is sitting there saying, why should school children you know, look at fintech? You know, is it a potential career for them? You know, most people wouldn't be inspired at school of finance or technology, but they might be inspired by fintech. That's because it's entrepreneurial, it's innovative, there's careers out there that they might not have even considered or probably don't even know exist. You know, so we wanted to go back into schools to actually say, what is FinTech? You know, we are aware of all the banks have national programs going into schools. So we're sitting there talking to them and saying, well, how can we make sure that they also talk about FinTech? By that, you're also hopefully educating on financial literacy. You know, too many people in this country, you know, 16 million people in this country have less than £100 in savings. You know, so we sit there and if we can show them that actually FinTech may be a better solution than their current banking provider, or how the banks are changing, if they're with the traditional high street banks, why they should go to them, you know, why they shouldn't go to a payday lender, they can go and get a loan you know, from, from FinTech or from one of the high street banks. You know, so we want to sit there and educate on financial literacy through FinTech, but also look at a career as well. Back in 2017, EY was commissioned to run a fintech census to find out the priority concerns for the UK's industry. This year, a follow-up census has been repeated, and we caught up with EY's head of fintech, Tom Bull, to explore some of the early findings. Well, we've been working on the census now for a few months. Uh, we've contacted over a thousand companies in the UK fintech sector and actually got responses back from 224 of those at the moment, uh, sharing data on their priorities, their, their growth, uh, and really what they're looking to achieve in 2019. When we were designing the census this time around, we decided to put particular focus on the skills and talent topic, uh, explore that in more detail than we have in previous years, and therefore we asked a range of questions on that, uh, including areas people were focusing on, in particular areas of skill need, uh, the topic of digital skills in particular, um, and headcount and hiring plans for, for the year ahead. Attracting uh, qualified or suitable talent uh, continues to be the number one challenge facing fintechs in 2019, which is consistent with our 2017 study. The most important skills for fintechs, which are also the most difficult to hire, are in software engineering, systems architecture and development. And the second most important skill area is data analytics, which was also identified as the, the second hardest uh, area of skills to hire. Keen to hear whether this chimed with the concerns of his members, we went up to Canary Wharf to meet Ben Braben, CEO of Level 39. Finding the right people and recruiting them and retaining them and helping them to be as productive as possible to play their best game is the central challenge, I think, for every entrepreneur based here. There's such a diversity of companies here that the skills that people need vary, um, but clearly both business development and technology development are key areas. And so the hunger for people who can help bridge the gap between early stage companies and big incumbent companies and help deal with regulators and investors. Those are important skills. Uh, but so, of course, are the technical skills required to build the capabilities of the businesses. One of the challenges that early stage companies face, of course, is that they are individually quite hard to spot. So there's a great deal of, um, uh, of a challenge of being noticed and known 
for small early stage companies. We helped to mitigate that by bringing so many companies together. So 1,250 people from about 50 different countries currently work in level 39. Um, and so there's a kind of benefit of aggregation. But one of the things that uh, early stage companies I think really benefit from is being seen for the purposefulness, the social value that they bring, the extent to which not only are they creating new capabilities uh, for their customers, but also they're creating new jobs and, um, and plenty of value to society at large. We've all got to get better at articulating that purpose and making the case for business as a public good. One of the challenges of talent, of course, is figuring out where you go looking for it and how you ensure that it comes looking for you as well. And of course, very often people respond to all sorts of patterns, and that's one of the things that diminishes diversity, not just in early stage companies, but throughout the economy. Uh, so I would just remind everyone of the challenge of making sure that you recruit in a way which supports and welcomes diversity. The benefits uh, are emphatically worth it. As Ben mentioned, working with the VC firms is incredibly important. And I was pleased to catch up with the CEO of Augmentum VC firm, Tim Levine. We started by talking about the UK's position globally, thoughts post-Brexit, how we can tap into regional talent. But then also towards the end, I asked him about his considerations of the importance of diversity. Well, I think, you know, we are, you know, part of an industry that has grown tremendously over the last uh, five to six years. I think the number of both fintechs, um, the amount of capital coming into the market, and obviously the growth uh, in people uh, that's being attracted to the sector. Uh, the tens of thousands of people that are going to be part of this industry uh, over the coming years, you know, there is a challenge for us uh, as a country uh, to continue to attract uh, talent. What we don't have is that enough incumbent talent here in the UK, here in London. Um, we need, you know, post-Brexit, a very uh, progressive uh, immigration policy for uh, skills and for talent. And I think, you know, without it, uh, the growth of a lot of our fintech businesses will, you know, will be challenged as a result. So we have, you know, really a unique opportunity here. We've built something truly uh, world class. We just now need to build on it over the next five to ten years. And if we get the talent piece wrong, uh, then we are at threat uh, of allowing another, you know, major country, major city uh, taking our crown as the global fintech lead. And of course, there's potential talent across the UK as well. What are you thinking about there? Well, I think what we've done very well here in London uh, is create the centre of gravity uh, for fintech. We're sitting here in the city of London, uh, 800 years of, of commerce. But I think, you know, we have a huge amount of talent uh, across the country. And what we haven't done as well is tap into, into that network, whether it's in the north of England, in Manchester, whether it's in Edinburgh, uh, or even in the southwest as well. Uh, and I think it's really important for us as, as investors to spend more time uh, outside of London. Yes, the centre of gravity is here. Yes, the pots of capital are here. Uh, but increasingly, you know, we've got a great business that's now based in Manchester, an interactive investor that ha has you know, several hundred people and will continue to grow. Um, and there are some very uh, you know, exciting pockets of talent. We just want these pockets to, uh, to become much more significant and real clusters. We're hearing much more that uh, investors are looking closely at firms in which they are thinking about investing and asking more ke keenly about their diversity numbers and their dynamics. Is that your experience? I think you know, what we're seeing now in terms of diversity is a real sea change in approach. Um, perhaps you know this was an area three to four years ago where people talked about it but I would certainly say in the last 12 to 18 months we're seeing real call to action uh, there is uh, you know a genuine uh, behavioral change it's certainly important for us uh, we need to uh, one be you know, better uh, at it uh, we need to ask the right questions we need to work with our companies so they really understand the importance of it but I'm really comforted that we are, you know, we are seeing the start, uh, you know, of a of a sea change. But it will take some time as well. Financial services industry, unfortunately, when it comes to diversity, uh, you know, hasn't had that at the forefront, um, and there is a long way to go. But I'm, you know, feeling very positive about the steps that are being taken today. Myself, as a female founder and entrepreneur in the fintech industry, and also, of course, as host of this podcast. It was interesting to hear what people had to say about the value of diversity and inclusion. I thought it'd be helpful to go back to EY's head of fintech, Tom Bull, to see what the census might say. Well, we know that one of the things that actually really turns people off um, looking at jobs in, in industries is a lack of diversity. 
Uh, and in our 2017 fintech census, it showed us that women represent just 29% of the workforce within UK fintech, uh, despite 47% of the workforce overall being female. And as for women in leadership positions, the same study found that only 17% of senior roles within the sector are held by women. When I think about the 2019 census, I actually expect to see quite similar themes coming out in respect of women's representation in the overall fintech workforce and in terms of the trends at the senior leadership level. So it really shows us there's a lot more work to be done in this area. So it's very interesting to hear that on one hand, we have an irreversible trend. We have a growing appreciation of the value that diversity and inclusivity brings to the industry. And there's a very keen need to tap into that talent pool. On the other hand, the research is showing, or the early insight into the census, is showing that uh, we have some way to go. So I was delighted to grab some time with Alison Rose. Alison Rose is the Deputy CEO of NatWest Holdings with responsibility for corporate, commercial and private banking for both NatWest and RBS. But in addition, Alison was commissioned by the Treasury and the Prime Minister to explore the central and essential question, why do we not have more female entrepreneurs? The Rose Review was a review commissioned by the Treasury into uh, the opportunity and barriers facing female entrepreneurs in the UK. And what we were looking at was what is, why are more female entrepreneurs not starting up? And really trying to get underneath you know, what the facts were and also what the barriers and potentially some interventions to really help solve this and the findings were pretty stark um, we did some a lot of detailed research lots of interviews looked at previous reports and also looked at best in class around the world and what we found was that in the UK only 33% of our females um, of our entrepreneurs are female compared to over 40% in best in class countries more shockingly only 1% of VC funding goes to female entrepreneurs uh, male led businesses are 50% more likely to have have, um, almost four times the amount of capital at scale up. So um, if you look at all of that and say, if we can solve that problem, and get the level of female entrepreneurship to male entrepreneurship, which best in class countries can and have done, you're talking about a £250 billion opportunity to the UK economy. So that's really at the time we're talking about productivity and growth, that's potential we can unlock and support by intervening. And in terms of the, uh, the opportunities and the barriers, where, where do you see the sticking points or where do you see the unlocking moments? So the, the barriers really, we try to dil- distill it down to what are the really core cool barriers that affect women. So um, lack of awareness and access to financing and capital is a fundamental point. That 1% VC, VC funding statistic is shocking. Um, there is also uh, for women a uh, higher risk awareness Um, So they're not risk averse, that's not the issue, they're more risk aware. Primary care responsibilities are definitely a barrier. Lack of relatable role models um, came out very strongly and relatable local role models and actually if you can solve that it really does help. And a perception of less experience um, and less skills which we identified as being not true. So those are the five real barriers when you distill it down. Now that makes it much easier because then you can actually do something about those and what we were trying to come up with was a series of recommendations where public and private sector can work together to come up with practical interventions because there's no silver bullet here you know I can't wave a magic wand and say okay look everyone go and do this so the interventions can really be around raising that awareness and access to capital and I think transparency here is really important so we've launched a a voluntary code for both um, banking um, partners to actually say how much money they put to help female entrepreneurs as well as a we're looking at a code of practice for VC and private equity so we can be transparent and raise awareness. And are they coming into effect immediately? Yeah well so we're developing the code in banking so um, uh, we've signed up to that obviously at RBS and NatWest and Lloyds and Santander have also signed up. Uh, the UK Association of Angel Investors have signed up as well so we're developing now the metrics. We're working with Barclays and HSBC to encourage them to come in as well and I think what that will create is transparency and I, I'm a great believer if you have transparency in a target you can actually make a difference so that's that's being developed. Um, the code for VC We've set up a task force backed by the Treasury um, that's being run by Alexandra Daly and she's developing that task force to explore how we can raise awareness um, of VC funding and get more women in front of VCs as well. I I guess my next question then would be, uh, because you set this great ambition, 
by 2030. Talk us through the ambition and talk us about uh, what we must be mindful of to be successful. The ambition is to get um, you know, more entrepreneurs, more female entrepreneurs, and we've set a really ambitious target. Actually, that was set by the Prime Minister and the Treasury. So I think the Prime Minister um, and the Treasury have really got behind this report. It's their report and recognise that actually they're leaving potential on the table. So they've committed to more female entrepreneurs. Now, I think, by again, by setting a target, great, but how do you do it? So we need to encourage more young girls to think about starting businesses. So get in the pipeline at the very beginning. I think that that's the issue. This is a pipeline issue. Put more help in, relatable role models, more visibility of how to get access and support, more opportunity to scale up, um, and you know the right intervention to encourage people to have the right skills and opportunity and then the funding partners to intervene at the right point with the right type of funding to help entrepreneurs i I'd, I'd said very publicly one of the things i was concerned about is a lot of entrepreneurs start their businesses by using their credit card or borrowing money from their family that's not the right answer the other side of the problem is they end up giving away all their equity too early so how do you create visibility of what financing what support you need at the right point in your journey and I think if we can solve those interventions across the pipeline and make this an area where people can really deliver their potential because there's no lack of ambition out there that's the really exciting thing about this if you can unlock that potential in that pipeline then you'll get to those targets. And does that include going right the way back into schools? So I launched a programme last year called Dream Bigger. And what, what we've done is we've taken our entrepreneur development programme, which is what we put the entrepreneurs who go through our accelerator hubs, um, and we've packaged it to go into schools. And I'm specifically focusing on girls. So we've taken that as a training programme. We've taken some of our sports sponsorship and taken these amazing female athletes who have really positive body image, strength, um, package that with that programme and some of our creative writing sponsorship to create a dream bigger around building entrepreneurial mindset, resilience and ambition. And we're piloting that in a number of schools and rolling that out now. There are lots of private sector companies who do tech courses. We have Girls Can Code that go into schools, Microsoft, Dell, all of these companies do great things. I think the more we get into schools and actually open that opportunity of you can do this, that entrepreneurship, running your own business is a real opportunity. Because if you're in an area where you don't come across entrepreneurs, your parents are not entrepreneurs, there aren't the role models, why would you consider it? So getting into schools, getting the ambition, that gets the pipeline at the beginning. But that's not enough. Once you've done that, you've got to intervene right the way through the pipeline to make sure people have the support when they need it. So tell us about the regional initiatives. So we have local relationship managers sitting all around the UK supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs. And that regional local support is so important. And we've seen that through how we support business. And for entrepreneurs, that's really critical. What they say is they want local, relatable role models who understand their economy, who are connected into the ecosystem, that ecosystem that provides huge amounts of support. So one of the initiatives that we've done and launched is our Entrepreneur in Residence and our Banker in Residence program, working with the LEPs, so public private sector working together to make sure support is accessible and local. And I think that's massively, massively important. Sometimes everything centres to London or centres to, you know, the big city centres. You want to make sure people can get the support when they need it and in a way that is relevant to them because what we found is when they get it, it makes a disproportionate impact on confidence, risk awareness and where to go for help and I think that's a critical element. So having heard what Alison had to say, I thought it would be important to go and find a female founder and I caught up with Karen Rudich. Karen is the co-founder and CEO of a business called Firedrake and I asked her what inspired her to leave the world of corporate life to become an entrepreneur. I've been working in financial technology for 18 years and I've always loved the size, the complexity and the diversity of the industry and particularly the corporate digital transformation challenges that it poses. I've been involved with traditional models, used internal and external resources, and just kept thinking there's got to be a better way. And unfortunately, the challenge for firms out there was only becoming more and more complex, the urgency becoming more and more pressing and the need to make change and true transformation for improvement bigger and bigger and more material for them. So I thought, why not me? Why not now? I like a challenge. So I went ahead and set up Firedrake uh, as a firm to go and help the banks 
transform and the financial services industry transform. There are so many talented women on these platforms and there is a lot of support and advice out there. The best support I ever received was, uh, if you're unsure, ask for help. The next generation needs to understand that they're not alone and this is a great industry to come in and set up and really help them develop their skills. We want them to consider being entrepreneurs. We want them to come to the industry. There are so many opportunities, not just in technology, but in financial services and digital marketing and marketing and understanding customers across many, many very different areas. And we need that young talent. We need those new minds. We need people who reflect our customers and the DNA that makes up our beautiful country in the UK. So yes, uh, anything that could inspire the future generations. I think it's, it's important, particularly if the UK wants to stay at the top of the leagues for attracting talent. As we head into Series 5 of Diversity Podcast, and from the many interviews that we've now done, there's always a message that comes across loudly and clearly. If you want to drive change, the tone must be set at the top of the organisation. So we were keen to hear from two CEOs, two of Innovate Finance members, to see what they're doing in their organisations. My name is Hussein Kasai and I'm the CEO and one of the three co-founders at Onfido. Onfido helps businesses verify the government IDs of the users that they're onboarding by making sure it's a genuine ID and that the photo on the ID matches the person's face. So we're here talking about growth and scale and many congratulations on raising your you know, 50 million, which is fantastic. So we imagine a proportion of this will be dedicated to scaling out the team. So what sort of roles are you looking to fill? Across the company, there are a fair few vacancies we have to fill. The key two, one is growth, which includes sales, marketing and things of that nature. And second is technology, which includes engineering, products, design, machine learning and so on. And are you finding it easy to hire people? Hiring is not easy. It never has been. And it is having a recognized brand helps a little bit, but it, it is tough. Absolutely. I would, in fact, go and say it's probably, it's not probably, it is actually the toughest thing for, for us anyway, for I would suspect for most startups. Fundamentally, any business is the sum of its people. So there's talk of being in the right market with the right products and the right time and so on, and that's fine. But for me, it's very much always been the right people. And when you look at anything that we have done that has worked out well, you can very clearly attribute that to a team lead or an individual contributor and in all likelihood a whole team that have delivered that. So we, from the outset, were very fortunate to have a strong team and have really worked hard to build on that ever since. And do you think that leadership is changing in terms of being able to take that talent and nurture it and, and drive it forward? Yes, in so far as the way we approach it, because we're now just over 240 people, there's no way you could scale by just having a traditional recruitment function, bring people in and put them in a team. Every team lead, now we have 50 team leads, they all drive the recruitment process. And they, everything from sourcing to interviewing, we have a recruitment team that assists, but it's ultimately the team lead, the hiring champion, so to speak, that drives the process end to end. And then they are then tasked when the person joins to have a development program, a training program, a coaching program, and so on. And we have a pretty strong philosophy on what we mean by a team lead. And it's, it's not necessarily a manager, whereas a manager's sort of connotations of controlling you, whereas a team lead attracts followers and is able to always set an example, always care for their team, and most importantly, be a coach to their team. And that's, that's in particular why it, it works well, the way that we've structured it for, for our particular needs. And, and clearly, culture matters. And when you think about the culture as you grow, what are the big things you're thinking about? We thought of culture quite early on, and it's core to everything that we do. We have five cultural values in particular that are represented by sort of animal logos. And we celebrate them and we ensure that every new team member not only is a competency fit, but very much so is a cultural fit. It's just as important. Our specific cultural values, one is a penguin, which is about collaborating and working together. The second is a lion, which is to be proud of your work. Third is a finch, a Darwinian finch, so that you're thinking outside of the box. Fourth is a chimp, so you're learning and teaching others. And the fifth is a bumblebee, where you're creating customer buzz or you're always thinking of the customer needs. And they have been very pivotal to everything that we do because there needs to be a way of setting priorities. And as any organization, the way you generate value is ultimately your resources or predominantly people. The processes, that is people putting structure to the ways of working, things that can be structured. And then what you're left with is priorities. And 
not everything can be structured into a process. A lot of decisions are basically ad hoc or just happen with the information that you have on that specific day. So when you consider priorities, you really need the culture to drive those decision-making processes so that you can have a decentralized flat hierarchy with everyone making the right choices without this a grand CEO that is sort of omnipotent and knows everything and omnipresent and is able to sort of decide. The way that we do it is by having such a strong culture, we can just trust the team will make the right decisions when we're not in the room. By we, I mean what you traditionally classify as decision makers. For us, every single team member is a decision maker. And as you think about the next generation, how are you actually inspiring that next generation yourself? A big area for us is to ensure that we empower the team. And it's very easy to see that people tend to like it. They like to feel empowered, they like to learn. We're living amongst lifelong learners, so that's a really core part of the job. And they like making decisions. And they like to see the progress and the impact that they have. If I were to say three things that people like the most is one is a sense of community and working together and like teamwork. Second is to have impact and what they're working on and sort of delivering key results. And third is to be empowered to, to have an impact. So when we get those things right, uh, you tend to have a very inspired team. Are there any other particular things as you're growing or that you've learned in your journey about talent and, and in the context of, of diverse talent as well? In many ways, the essence of startups and specifically entrepreneurship is to look for potential and given how important the team are is to look for potential in the individuals and the teams that you're hiring so it's not necessarily hiring based on someone's grades because someone may have lower grades but they may be a better fit because perhaps they've gone through adverse circumstances to get those grades and in a startup given that things are moving at a fast pace those with specific skill sets such as having been through adverse circumstances tend to do better for instance therefore it is not just when you hire, it's, it's thinking through who has the potential and most importantly, setting up the right environment for those with high potential to be able to thrive, learn fast and contribute fast. We are also very conscious of diverse views, as varied as possible. So we have programs whereby we do insights work to know if someone's an introvert or an extrovert, for instance. We consciously work in a boardroom setting or in a normal meeting to make sure there's appropriate time for people to contribute. Team leads are trained to ask specifically if someone doesn't contribute so much, ask them to contribute where appropriate and, and things of that nature so that you don't necessarily just have those who are too talkative sharing their views, but pulling from everyone in, in the organization. And it's only when you have a diverse range of ideas that you tend to work towards getting to what the ideal truth may be for that specific problem or challenge. I'm Adam Toms, uh, CEO of uh, OpenFin here in Europe. OpenFin is uh, the OS of finance. The best way to describe that is if you think about your mobile phone, you get this amazing device that allows you to add and delete apps, discover them in a pretty unique way, and also all of the apps work seamlessly together. OpenFin's bringing that same experience to financial desktops. So from your perspective, what dominant skill sets are emerging in the industry today? From a startup perspective, uh, you can really think about the organizational culture. Uh, what are some of the attributes? They're coming in fairly uh, kind of not debt free, but certainly uh, legacy free uh, and very, very asset light. They're very, very nimble uh, and they can innovate. So what does that lend itself in terms of the people that are successful in terms of those firms? It's people who can think they innovate, they're more entrepreneurial, they're more driven, they've got product uh, and clients at the front and centre of their mind. That's certainly true in large organisations, but it's particularly relevant for startup and new companies. And do we have enough of that talent today? Well, I think this uh, talent definitely exists. I think it really comes down to uh, making sure that you get that diversity. One of the things that we're very focused on is making sure we're not just looking within capital markets, the old uh, kind of stomping ground perhaps of some of the, uh, the management team, but really thinking about you know cross industry, where do we find these types of skill sets where do we find these types of people uh, and you know we've hired um, you know uh, employees from very small firms you know with just you know a handful of people 10 or 20 people all the way through to you know employees from Sony PlayStation or Goldman Sachs it's incredibly diverse the talent definitely exists you just need to know where to go and look for it so how does the leadership team then think about diversity I think at the you know the heart of a smaller firm you know we have a drive and ambition to succeed and succeed as quickly as possible right uh, and make the company very, very successful, um, both for our shareholders and our end clients. Uh, we want to create a, a great product. Um, that really means that our drive is to find the best people, no matter where they are, and bring them into the organization. And I think the management team is always deeply engaged uh, you know, in that thinking. 
um, and think about the sources and you know where we can find particular talent pools. And that's why we act in a in a fairly unencumbered way when we think about sources of talent. And I know in the States you're doing some very exciting things going out into other pools of talent. Tell us about that. Yes, we've been partnering with a firm called Code Nation for uh, a number of years now. Code Nation are really focused on identifying children and schools in perhaps more deprived areas in New York and San Francisco area and bring in uh, tech and coding courses to the high school. That's actually facilitated by uh, volunteers from organisations like OpenFin uh, and is a very nice structured programme to introduce coding to children who perhaps might not have access or think that that's a potential career for them. The stats from Code Nation I think really speak for themselves. Uh, 74% of the alumni of Code Nation, if they completed the first two years of the, of the course, 74% of that group are currently in some type of STEM work and actually within that 63% specifically around computer science which I think is an incredibly high number. So, so what, what's the male-female ratio? The gender mix for Code Nation is really quite impressive. Over 40% of the students are female, 60% male. So what should we really be focusing on then? I think there's really two elements that drive this diversity. First one's going to be the senior management uh, and leadership team of organisations really embracing diversity, setting that tone from the top. We've seen this before uh, in financial services when the FCA, for example, had uh, their drive around culture and conduct within firms by the senior management team setting that tone, uh, it penetrated down through the firm, through various, you know, whether it's policies, forums, you know, uh, teachings, whatever it may be. On the flip side, point two, I really think is, you know, how do we how do we get this going from the grassroots? And uh, we talked earlier about Code Nation doing excellent work. More programs like Code Nation would certainly be welcomed. I think ultimately the government has a real role to play here. We know that uh, the UK government, for example, uh, had their STEM white paper and issued their recommendations some time ago. But uh, you know, there's lots more that we could be doing. So I think a burning question is, as an industry. Do we appeal to school age talent? I think a connection with uh, children is uh, fairly simple in some terms. They have this great thing in their pocket called a mobile device, which is at the centre of the universe. It's delivering a great experience, product experience to them every day. The technology is improving all the time. They want the latest device. They want the latest application with the latest features and functions. So how do we get the children to understand they can be part of designing that journey? Uh, now, with the growth in fintech and the need for technology uh, globally, and uh, the numbers from Charlotte were really uh, quite impressive this morning, I think it's really incumbent on all of the technology providers, uh, from the you know, newest of startups all the way to the largest organisations, to really be nurturing that talent uh, and, and spending time with uh, school children. So that pretty much wraps up the special episode recorded at the Innovate Finance Global Summit in April 2019. I'd like to thank all our guests for being part of the show and to you for listening to Diversity Podcast. And for final comments, I leave them with Charlotte Crosswell. I'm so encouraged when you look at kids sitting there, seeing them on the tube and they're using a smartphone. Now, might, some people might frown on that. Some people might say that's a great idea. They're getting involved in technology. What you are now seeing, children of 10 have grown up with smartphones. Yeah, and what we have to do is harness that power of technology, and that's across everybody. Yeah. Everyone around the world you know, that's unbanked, two-thirds of them will have access to a smartphone. So how can we sit there and say, you already have tech skills to operate that smartphone? You know, so how do we sit there and think, right, let's move that forward, and let's get those kids, whatever their background is, whatever their gender is, whatever their ethnic background is, to sit there and consider a career. It's really important for fintech companies to have a diverse workforce. I think we've got a little, gone a little bit too far on gender, and gender's really, really important, and we get huge amounts of support you know, from some of the ethnic minority groups we work with over gender, because they want us to tackle that first. But you, know, you could argue a 25-year-old analyst coming out of university, whether you know, female or male, is going to be you know, probably thinking similar ways. So let's look at backgrounds, let's look at social mobility, let's look at people on the spectrum. You know, autism is very common to be seen in computer science and data scientists you know, because that's the, you know, that's the way their mind works. And fintech is much more open to that diverse workforce than maybe the traditional banks. This episode of Diversity Podcast was produced by me, Kieran Yates, on behalf of Julia Street's Productions. You can find out more about guests on this week's show on our website, diversitypodcast.com, and that's diversity with a C, not an S. Whilst you're there, you can also sign up to our newsletter for all our latest updates. To be sure of catching all our future podcasts, subscribe to our feed in iTunes or your favourite podcast app. 
And if you've enjoyed this episode of Diversity Podcast, remember to give us a rating or review. It all helps promote the show to a wider audience. Finally, our Twitter handle is at DiversityPod. Thanks for listening.